Um, I want to talk about the systems that we've built and the project organization that, that built these systems. And also highlight a few aspects of, of the systems, uh, just to demonstrate how we have used Groovy and Grails and other things that, that start with a G. And uh, I want to talk about how we introduce these technologies in, uh, in our project and uh, about, about the choices we made. I will, I will be showing a bit of code along the way just to get all the way down into the details of this. Um, I want to uh, highlight some of the mistakes that we made along the way, this in the hope that uh, you won't repeat these mistakes. This is uh, really the presentation, or rather the, the presentation I'm aiming for is the presentation that I would have loved to have heard two years ago before we started on this project, but there you have it. Uh, my intended audience is uh, two groups. One is uh, the group of professional software developers like myself who do this for a living. That uh, re we really exist to develop and deliver functioning software solutions to customers. And we might use Grails for that. The other part of the intended audience is, uh, is the Grails community, those that, that build these magnificent things. Uh, for you, I will be showing an example of uh, how these technologies are used in a real project, and ho they're hoping that way to give you some feedback about what it looks like when people actually use it. Of course, you know that already, but feedback is always good. And finally, I want to answer the question in, in the title, of course. Just a little bit about Systematic, just for background. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, Denmark's largest privately owned software company, which doesn't say a lot in such a small country. But still, uh, we do software development. That's what we do. We do things in the defense sector, healthcare, public services, and a little bit in intelligence and national security. Well, 430 people altogether. Uh, some of our projects are three developers doing maintenance on some old system. Other projects are 70 developers plus, plus uh, support personnel developing large complex solutions. So quite a span there. One of the things we take pride in is our ability to deliver on time. So 97% uh, last year of our projects or deliveries really were delivered on time. One of the reasons where we're able to do that is uh, because we have a level five certificate according to the capability maturity model. And um, if you happen to know what that is, uh, you'll know that there are very few companies who've got this certificate. Well, visit us at systematic.com. Myself, uh, got myself a couple of degrees, got a job, got another job, and have now been at Systematic for, for 15 years. What I do, well, I do software development, software design, and, and a fair amount of programming. I've programmed in, well, let's see, C, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic, didn't like that, Java, and Groovy, so languages all over the place. I, I, being a, a senior, I can't sit and program by myself all the time, so I spend quite a lot of time doing what I call technical leadership, coaching, and uh, looking after uh, other programmers on my team. And I also do other things outside my project uh, to my project manager's continued consternation. I'm away much of the time uh, doing things like process improvement, uh, our software development process, for instance, which I'm the main architect for. Um, and what I like, well, hope, gladly I like most of what I do. If, if I'm to name a, a favorite programming language, it would be C++. That's really my home base uh, and the, the language which I'm most comfortable with and most experienced with. Uh, so really, one of the reasons why uh, I, I like Groovy is that it is almost as expressive as C++, but it's in a different way. And that's good because I like our variety and change. And some other things I like. Time for a little demo of uh, the system we've built. Well, here's the story. A customer comes into a bank and says, I don't like my old bank. I want to switch to your bank. And uh, I've got a savings account, and I've got a credit card, and I've got an insurance and things. Uh, you figure this out and call me when you're done. Okay, says the bank. Well, we'd like to have you as a customer. Thank you very much. So they create a case on this customer, puts the information about all these products, financial products in the case, and sends it off to the old bank. Where an, another clerk opens this one, 
looks at it, hmm, 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 well, sad to see you go, but well, by law and custom, banks are obliged to, to do this uh, without further delay. So scribble, 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 and they send back what is called a nota back to the, uh, to the new bank, which can then call the customer and say, congratulations, you are now a customer at this bank. Yay. Actually, today in Denmark, this happens mostly by sending uh, pieces, sheets of paper in envelopes with stamps on them and doing phone calls. So very odd and very old-fashioned. We can't have that. So therefore, uh, what our customer asked us to do is to build a system that will support this. It's called the account switching system. And the user interface is in Danish. Well, there you have it. But anyway, this is a case. Got some case information on it uh, about uh, a customer. That's, that's me. Hi. And uh, what I can do here, imagine I'm the, the, the new bank and I want to add information about the products that, uh, that this new customer has got. He's got like, uh, I don't know, something like a, uh, where is it? A simple, uh, a simple savings account. There are some account numbers which I, I have to fill out here uh -huh. in, the, in the old bank and in the new bank. And how do we do the transfer? Well, I can select, select that from this combo. Uh, whatever this means, and uh, da, 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 something. Let's try and save this, see what happens. Oh dear, there's a validation error, so, okay, something, something. Oh dear, there's probably another validation error, so let's skip that, and I save that. Okay, um, there are, at the moment, 15 different um, product types in here. Some of them are huge, enormous amounts of information that have to be entered. The one with parentheses on them are the ones we haven't implemented yet, because this is work in progress. So if it crashes, well, it's because it's work in progress. OK, that's uh, just a short demo. I'll, I'll get back to that later. The system has two major features. Uh, one is uh, the property trading process, we call it. That's uh, what happens when you buy a house. You have to do a property trading. So this is a system where Danish banks and mortgage banks and real estate agents, they exchange information about, about properties, meaning mainly houses and things. Um, this system is going live uh, this spring, meaning that all property trading in, in Denmark will happen through this system. That's nice to know. Uh, the account switching process is the next feature we're building on this system. Are we spending our time now? And that's what I just demoed, which is what happens when a person wants to switch from one bank to another. So uh, these are some profoundly Danish systems built for a Danish customer in a Danish context. The, the domain language is English. Uh, excuse me, Danish, so much of it will probably be in, unintelligible, but I'll get you through it. The customer Enet is a uh, sort of a common ground for all Danish banks and mortgage banks and things, a uh, company they created so that they could meet there and discuss and develop uh, common solutions to common problems. Uh, this all started back in the summer of uh, 2011, and as I said, we're going into production with uh, the first bit uh, in May these days, really. Second bit started last summer and we're going into production sometime next year. That really depends on how many extra features uh, the customer wants to add to the system before they decide that now, now we've got a minimal usable and shippable uh, version of it. Architecture of this system, uh, really a fairly standard four-tier architecture. We are responsible for all the components which you see here except for, for the actor system. Actor means bank or mortgage bank or real estate agent. So they have to develop their own systems that integrate into this. Uh, they're probably not built using Rails. I don't know really. The back end part of this is, is a broker, a system to system uh, communication hub. What happens is that an actor system will uh, send in information like a request for an account switching into this back end, which will then, then route it uh, onto uh, to another bank. So the purpose of the back end is really routing and keeping track of the state of the process. There is very little actual data on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on this back end. It's, it's merely a broker. Uh, all the data about the processes reside out in, in, the, in the actor systems. So therefore, uh, there are some web services which the actor systems can call, and uh, we can then call, do callbacks to, uh, to web services which they must implement. The portal here is, 
is, it is meant to be an, uh, a user interface on top of the back end to be used by those banks and other agents we, who haven't developed their own solutions yet. So it's an interim solution, really. And uh, por the portal is where the Grails thing is happening, and that's what I'll be focusing on. Some technology choices here. Uh, thankfully, we only have one target browser, Internet Explorer. Um, the portal, as I said, uh, in Grails, uh, running in, on an Oracle WebLogic uh, container. Uh, the, uh, the web services are specified contract first, SOAP, WSTL, and XSD files, lots of those. Uh, the backend is written in Java. Uh, the, uh, the XSD specifications are translated into Java using uh, what's it called, Java API for XML binding, I think, JAXB, so we translate into Java. Um, access to the database via Java Persistency API, uh, also running on an Oracle WebLogic server. Um, and the database, an Oracle database. So, a bit about security. This uh, lives out on, on the big bad internet where there's no security. Uh, so, uh, to access the portal, you, uh, you have session level um, authentication based on uh, the OSA standard, which is an implementation of X409 for user security heads. Um, OSA is, is known and used by every Dane in, in, in this room. It's the thing called NIMED, loosely speaking, in case you don't know it. So there's only session data on the portal. Uh, because of a requirement which says that every call to the backend must be per call authenticated and, and logged. The, da the database lives safely behind all this, so there's no security going down to the database. Um, so because of that requirement that, that all data access must be authenticated and logged, there is uh, no data stored on the portal. So the portal is sort of like an access system, interim solution, uh, but it doesn't use, it's a great application, but doesn't use GORM Hibernate to store its data. All data is stored on the back end. So that means that the portal calls some of the, of the public uh, web services which the active systems use, but it also calls some extra web services we have implemented that has to do with saving and retrieving data. So because of that requirement. So overall, fairly standard uh, stack here, uh, not as much Grails and Groovy and so on technology in this stack as there might be, but Grails is really the, the newcomer. This technology stack we've been using together with the custom of a previous project, so it's known, it's tried and true, it works, so why change it? But we needed to develop a, a fairly complicated portal, so we needed a new tool, and that tool was great. I uh, want to highlight a bit of, of the system design, we've built, because we've built something that we think is pretty neat, neat enough to, to show you guys, hopefully. Okay, so we've got, we've got all these different kinds of products here, insurance, credit card, and whatnot. The system must uh, support the editing and display of a large number of these different types. Uh, a product is made of two bits. There's a request which goes from the new bank to the old bank requesting the, uh, the switch, and there's a note going the other way with details about, about the switch. And uh, then there are lots and lots of types, and it doesn't really matter what the types are, so if you can't read the words, it doesn't matter. There are, there are lots. Okay, um, looking at a bit of code here. Let's see where I've got it. Mm -hmm. Got a bit of a switching problem here. Ah. Mm, this is interesting. Okay, any clever person in the room can help me out. I'm, I'm, I'm remote desktoping back to my my company and PC. Okay, there's my toolbar. Yeah, and I can't alternate between the windows, and it doesn't work. Anyway, uh, let's see, where are we? Here we are. As I said, all this is specified uh, by some XSD, so let's look at how it actually looks uh, in the XSD. You go away. So here's the type, the request type, and there is a choice because there are 15 different variants of it. Uh, let's look at something here. A simple savings account looks like this. Uh, 
really this. Um, what it has is that it's got two account numbers, this one, which I showed in the user interface, an account number and another account number, and then something here which is a transfer method, which is an enum, which obviously translates into a combo box on the user interface. So the task is to, uh, to take all these, damn, all these different types here and then produce user interfaces for them. And since there are lots, uh, it pays to, to do uh, something general, some general way of fixing this. Um, the first thing we tried was to say, hey, uh, these, these types here by JAXB, they get turned into Java. Could we somehow inherit some Groovy from that Java and then say that's our domain type and then ask Rails to generate views and controllers for that? And we would have it all just in one go and that didn't work. Uh, so we tried fiddling with that approach, getting Rails to do as much of, of the work as possible, but we couldn't get it to work. And that might be because we're stupid or haven't tried enough. Maybe it's because that's not really the intention of that generation bit of Grails, or maybe it's just too hard to use. I don't really know. But we had to come up with a solution, so uh, what we did was this. Okay, so we got the savings account XSD specification. That, that, that's the, th the specification of what we have to do. So uh, JAXB generates really a, uh, a data transfer object that's over on your right, yes, on your right, uh, which is just a bunch of fields with setters and getters on them, really. But that's what we need to call the web services on the back end. So we have to uh, produce a user interface which is isomorphic, really, is meaning displaying the same things as this XSD type. So manually we have created a, uh, two GSP templates, one called edit, one called show for this type and so on for all the other types. And what it, what it contains is a number of invocations of other templates. And I'll show you this in code in a moment. We, did, we do this manually. We also uh, take this XSD and then sort of manually translate it into Groovy. So we get a model class here expressed in Groovy, uh, which contains fields. And then of course the constraints that, that go with it because we want, we want user interface validation. So we really have uh, four different representations of the same thing here. And they are isomorphic in the sense that the, the fields have the, got the same names and the types of the fields are isomorphic to the types of the fields in the other representations. So isomorphism all the way down in the, in the hierarchy. Let's look at this in code. Uh, I showed you that what we got here is uh, three elements, two account numbers and some enum thing. Um, next thing is... Blink, blink. Is to see what does what what this looks like in uh, in uh, in the uh, in the domain type here in Groovy. Go away, please. So there are two account numbers. This word means account number again, and there's a transfer method down here, and then some constraints for validation. Okay, and then we have got. Uh, Let's see if we can find the, the proper one, request template, yeah, here it is. So the, uh, the template for rendering this uh, invokes some other templates. There's a template for rendering an account number and another one, and there's a template for rendering an enum. And the show, uh, the, the, uh, the show page looks similar, except that it just displays the thing. Uh, now, the way this works at, at runtime is that uh, they, uh, the GSP files, lots of templates working together, produce the form where you can do, the, you do your editing. Then when you hit the submit button, uh, you get bind data, basically running uh, spring um, data binding, meaning that all this data gets copied uh, into, the, uh, into the, uh, the Grails object. Oh, good. Now, if this were, were a GORM Hibernate solution, we would also then, poof, by magic, have this into our database, but we can't have that, so we need to do this more explicitly. We need to translate our, our Grails object into a JAXB object, which we can then use as a, as a data transfer object for calling the save operation on the back end. Well, uh, the way we go, go about it is the, by introducing something we call the isomorphic mapper. It's a little bit of code that can that can copy one object to another by following uh, the names of the fields. And since everything is isomorphic all the way down, it works both ways. So we get a JAXB object, and then we can call, call the backend. 
Uh, let me show you how that looks. Where am I? The isomorphic mapper has uh, just one operation called copy. It takes a source object, this is all very generic uh, groovy code, and there are lots of special cases that need to be handled, but never mind. The main part here really is to, where is it? <laughs> the main part here, oh yes, okay, to look at the source object and walk through all these properties, and so we, for each of those, we uh, find the corresponding property in, in the other, in the target object, and then we do some things, and then at some point we might recurse to the next level so that when we have an account number type, excuse me, when we have a savings, we have a loan request here and a loan request over there, part of that is an account number type, okay, so when we descend to that and we cover the account number type to its isomorphic correspondence over here and so on, Think. So that sort of works. Um, it's, uh, ow, excuse me, <laughs> that hurt. So by doing this, uh, we get a framework where all the, all the, all the handling, all these product types are sort of hidden away. Uh, the, the, the controller code and the mapper code and so on doesn't care about the actual product types. So that means that we can add new other product types to the system uh, without disturbing any other components. And we're going to do that because this is uh, really the essence of domain knowledge for this particular system. And, and that is bound to change and evolve over time. Um, one final element of the, our product framework. Um, again, looking at, at the XSD file here, come on. You see there are lots of element names in here all over the place. Actually, there are some 520 element names in, this, in these. Um, and there are some enumeration values here. Here's an account type, which might take on these different values here in this particular context. Um, if, you, if you understand Danish, you can sort of read what, what these mean, of course. The, the, the basic vocabulary is just plain Danish. But the actual meaning in the domain is beyond me and most of us. We don't want to become experts at financial systems in order to, or excuse me, at, at finance in, in order to implement this. But we do want all these element names and enumeration values to appear on our user interface. So we need to somehow fetch them from the, the XSD in some um, more or less uh, transparent way and transport them over to the user interface. So if you've got element names like this, uh, this is one of the, the baddest examples really. It's, it's also nonsense to me, even though I can sort of decipher what the actual words are here. But uh, looking at this, it's actually almost something you could put on a user interface um, to explain what this number field or whatever is all about. It just needs a little bit of polishing. If you could split this, look at the camel case again, do a split and then uh, down case everything except the acronyms uh, and then uh, do some substitution so you get special Danish characters for, for certain vowel combinations. Then you are left with this, which still doesn't quite make any sense to me, but I believe it makes sense to, to the clerk that has to use the system. So the way this works is that looking at the code, at some point we have to present a label uh, next to a field. Looking at the portal here, looking at the edit page for our account type. There's an account number edit uh, helper template here and it looks like this. It contains a label, really, something meaning account number and then two fields where you can enter the registration number and the ID of the account. So the label here uh, is rendered using a, a new template called label. What else? And it looks like this. Uh, here we invoke uh, the, the standard Grails uh, message tag. And what this one does is that, well, there is a code bit which means go look up in messages the properties and see what we should display on the user interface. But it also has a default. And the default is what it does when it can't find any string in the messages the properties. And the default here says, okay, ask the label generator to make a label from the element name. What's the element name? Well, that seems to be a parameter. Uh, yeah, it is. We got that here for the uh, for the um, 
for the account number. Yes, it says account number right there. Thank you. And, and that got it from the uh, from the edit template for this specific product type, where the element name is. Oh look, we we being we being really clever here. We're using some 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 sort of uh, constant here instead of bespoke uh, instead of uh, literals here. Aren't we clever? So let's see what it is. The actual display name here. It's uh, well some sort of nonsense word here. But it's not quite nonsense uh, because it's actually uh, the word used over in the in the XSD. Ta-da! So all I damn all I really need to 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 show you here is ah, come on is what uh, what the label generator does. Let's see if we can find it. And a uh, nice little piece of, of groovy code here, almost functional style. I need to improve on that. It's not quite sufficiently functional. But what it does is it, uh, it uses uh, great, uh, groovy support for regular expressions and its uh, magnificent little sub-language for, for handling sequences of things. Zero to minus three means everything in a sequence from the start until uh, two or three, I can never remember, from, from, the, from the end. So that's really a substring. Very nice syntax there. So that c converts uh, our, our element names from this form into a slightly nicer form. So that means that uh, every time I've got some uh, label on the, on the user interface, it's, it's automatically generated. I can also override that by using my messages or properties file to override specific labels here and there in case our user experience expert decides that just in this case we need a, a slightly different um, slightly different label so that's um, so that's a uh, user experience uh, at a low price okay so that's our our little product framework an obvious improvement on this would be to take the XSD files and then automatically generate the GSP templates and, and the Grails domain type because it's really a, a no thinking process doing that. So of course you shouldn't do that manually. So well, maybe we'll get to that, maybe not. Testing. Testing is all about Spock here. Most of our tests are automated, hardly any. Uh, we do a lot of exploratory testing, of course, but we don't do any scripted manual testing where you have to follow a test script. We use uh, Spock as a testing framework, and uh, using Spock is an unconditional delight. It's really so good. Vastly superior to any other testing framework I've used in any other language. So go get it if you don't know it. An example of a Spock test. Let's see, what did I plan on showing? Yeah. The isomorphic map is the thing that maps between uh, one, one type and, and another. Look, notice it's called a specification, it's not a test. Much more cool. Uh, some noise here. Um, yeah. Method names are strings. So you can write, in, you write uh, sensible statements here in, in plain English. Um, and it has a, this block structure, meaning, so, meaning that when you do this, then this is what you expect. So there are no, no explicit asserts or anything anywhere, and this block structure enforces a very nice discipline on, on your tests. So when you do this, uh, then this is supposed to happen. So no uh, funny annotations, no explicit asserts, very clean and nice. Another example is our actually our label generator uh, specification here, uh, kind of the same. I couldn't find a better name for this test except that the algorithm works. Uh, so I expect then when I enter some identifier and call make label, I get the expected value. And there's a where clause, which is really a table of uh, input and output values. So, so what this test does is that it iterates over all these all the rows in the table and performs a test for each. So very direct, very explicit, and very little noise. So lots of strange uh, text here and some some corner cases, of course, just to verify that it also works on those. And it runs and it works. Yay. So Spock, go get it. It's amazing. Uh, integration tests. Now, um, unfortunately, we don't have very many uh, real unit tests in our system. And that's because, apology coming up, uh, the, uh, the back-end architecture was something we inherited from a previous project and uh, written in Java and really thought not that amenable to unit testing. 
too many dependencies all over the place. But well, the architecture was in place and it worked. The, the framework of the back end was in place, so why not simply stay with that? So, um, and another thing, in order to prove to the customer that this system work, we, works, we have to implement a number of what we call integration tests, which are really uh, acceptance tests. They run as unit tests, but they run against a, a deployed version of the backend and so calling web services on it. So, a pure black box test. But that's our acceptance test. Lots easier than having to do that manually via the, uh, the, uh, the portal or some testing tool. So, well, since we have to write the integration test anyway, why bother with unit tests on top of that? Well, we ought to, because unit tests provide a lot faster turnaround time. I mean, in order to work with these integration tests, you have to build a system, deploy it onto a web, a web server, then run your not really unit tests and see whether it passes or not. Uh, it didn't, dang. dang. Now, where's the error? It's on the back end. That's all that tells me, really. So I have to go look for it. Instead of I can looking at a little unit, you know, and do a unit test and see if the unit works before I combine it with all the units. Oh well, so we ought to do that, but we haven't really gotten around to that. My apologies. Never apologize when you do a presentation. Remember, remember that. Okay, let's see what it looks like. They've got odd names, so I need to look that up. Ah, okay. When you try to send a request for an unknown product, you'll get an error. Well, that's a nice test to have. So again, it's Spock. Um, given is a really a set of setting the scene block, kind of like a setup uh, method in, in JUnit. Uh, given that we've got this situation, we've got a client, meaning that we can call a web service. Then let's uh, create a, a some, some sort of body here and then by using some utility, uh, let's send a request for it. Then I expect Boink to get an, uh, an exception thrown back at me. And uh, not so clean here, but that's our fault. Uh, some uh, search utility and an enormously long, long uh, comment here. Well, well, well. Uh, where, and then we iterate, because uh, there, there are two ways of calling our backend. One is via HTTP, another is via a, um, a, queue, a message, message queue. So I perform this test twice because I have to demonstrate to the customer that it works in both ways. Finally, uh, GUI tests, uh, automated GUI tests. Let me see. Looks like this, uh, written in uh, Spock, of course, but also written in JEP, which is a groovy adapter on top of WebDriver. So what this does is that it uh, performs some tests on, uh, on, the, on the portal, so invoke the portal. So again, given when, then, and all that, and you can almost read this, log in and navigate to the create case page. Uh, click the create button and create a case for the red bank. Then wait until we get onto the display of that case page. Now add some participants to the case, wait a bit, and click create product, and then we are at the create product page and our save button is disabled because we haven't entered any data yet. So this little one test that I can create a new product on a case. And there are of course lots and lots of these. Um, JEP has a, um, well it's, it's Spock really structured, but it has a page and module uh, model under it. There is always a, uh, a current page. And when the test runs, there's a current page, so the test delegates Groovy delegates to that page uh, in l unless uh, for and doing things which it can't do itself. So it's, that's basically everything that IntelliJ has underlined because it can't find it because it doesn't really know uh, about delegation. So that means that we can structure our tests so that we've got pages that specify how each page look and what operations are on pages, and the, and the uh, the tests themselves are fairly high level. And no, it's not really something you can make an end user write this uh, or, a, uh, or a, a customer specifying what, uh, what, what the product should do because it's still too techy. But, uh, 
it's still very nice, very nice model. Um, you address, uh, let's see, should we know we should, I think I'll skip that. Uh, we are very fond of JEP uh, because it means we don't have to do uh, manual regression testing of our port, you know, sit there and click through all the menus, see that still, they still work, yawn, yawn, yawn. So boring and you hardly ever find any errors anyway. But uh, this is our safety net together with all the other automated tests, of course, that we run this, these tests on our portal to make sure that everything still works. There are a few downsides to using JEP, unfortunately, and it's probably not JEP's fault, more likely it's our fault. The tests are slow, it takes minutes to execute. Uh, as you can see, there are some explicit, there are some waits in here, uh, which means wait until the, the DOM has loaded this page, and that's, that's all good and healthy, but uh, um, in several places in here, ah, you, you've got some nastiness like this. At this point, we, we stop and we wait for five seconds on, until the, uh, the user interface has settled down before we proceed with the test, and that's awful. And you can see there's a to-do, hey, try without this one. Um, but they have turned out to be necessary, and unfortunately, they're necessary uh, perhaps sometimes on our build server while this works perfectly well without on developer machines. Sometimes it's the other way around. It all depends on timing, and it's nasty and it's awful, and it makes our tests even slower, but we haven't been able to get around it. Well, so that's annoying, uh, but despite that, it just means that you shouldn't sit and stare at the test while, while it runs. Start, start running it and then go have lunch and come back and see whether they passed or not. If, if they don't pass, they actually pinpoint quite exactly and say, okay, this button is enabled and your test specified that it should be disabled. Okay, that's, that's my error, I can go debug that. So very nice, actually. Okay, um, that's our system. Uh, time to talk a bit about some of the errors we made, the mistakes we made. Here's the first one, not surveying the Grails landscape. Right, so there's a requirement that we can't use GOM Hibernate on the port to store our data. We have to store that more safely on the back end. So we did all this uh, work and explicit conversion to DXB and then calling save and retrieve operations on the back end. And it works. But uh, not that long ago, we discovered that there, there's actually a, there's a plugin that might do this for us. Something called the Spring Web Services plugin. I uh, haven't really looked at it, but perhaps. And there's also this one, which Graham talked about yesterday, actually. That might do the work for us. And uh, there might even be something else out there. It doesn't really matter what it is and which one we should select. But the, the point of this is that we, we haven't really looked enough to find a common solution to this problem. And really, we can't have the only one with a security requirement like this one, I suppose. So it's a bit annoying. Um, so lesson, always look for third-party solutions. Always spend uh, some time looking for third-party solutions, especially if you've got a problem that doesn't sound too specific, but really sounds like a general problem. Don't build it yourself. And second, you need background knowledge. You need to survey the landscape. You'll find things that are interesting and useful. Maybe not right now, but come two months time, you'll say, hey, this thing I read about, that sounds like something we could use here. So you need to invest in that. Maybe this was uh, the biggest mistake we made on this project. Another big, big mistake is believing that Groovy is really just Java. I'm going to do an injustice to, uh, to Groovy now, so watch out if I can. Oh dear, where are we? Where are we? Okay. Large enough? Yeah, so we do. Okay, this is this is uh, this Java. So in order to write Groovy, the first thing we do is remove the semicolons because they've been around since the days of C and they're not really necessary. So let's get rid of those. And uh, data like this is really is always private, so we don't need these markers here. It's getting cleaner now, isn't it? Uh, might as well re remove this one as well because Groovy doesn't honor these visibility markers anyway. Try it yourself. Uh, return types, nah, we just write def. And void, nah, we just write def. And constructors, we don't really need constructors because uh, there's something called a map constructor in Groovy and that'll do it for you. So uh, that's really it. And we don't need getters and setters either. That's just there. So I can just do def new. new 
whatever, and then I can use uh, the, uh, the map constructor uh, like this. And now I've got myself a new object, whatever object. But, oh dear, I made a spelling mistake. Uh, the field is not called date, it's called data. But this will run anyway, because uh, Groovy will look to see, is, is there a member, excuse me, is there a field called date? No, well, then it will just toss this parameter, ignore it, and, and go on. So, if you show this uh, to, to a seasoned Java programmer, uh, the, the uh, initial reaction might be, what? Uh, what's this? Okay, there are no semicolons. Well, whatever, nice, suppose. But really, no type checking. Visibility markers don't have any semantics. Why would we want to swap Java for this? There's no point. So what you get out of that, if you don't do anything, is a groovy code that is not very groovy. And that's a shame. I asked our programmers, uh, some of them, what our biggest mistake was. The biggest mistake was to think that you can just write Java and Groovy. You can end up getting the worst of both. So we have done some improvement on this since then. We need really, you need to invest in learning Groovy as Groovy. It's not Java. It looks like it, but it's not Java. Not investing in education, well, you look at grades.org and you say you can get modern, sophisticated, and robust <laughs> web application in record time. Well, who wouldn't want that? And in record time, oh, so it's cheap too. Oh, goody. Let's go and get that. Another programmer code. Biggest mistake was lack of initial education. This might be due to uh, Scrum, actually. You know, this agile thing, meaning that you had to deliver functionality very early in the project, meaning there's not really any time to learn new technology, which you have to use to deliver this new functionality. So there's a lot of old code we still have to live with. Beginners make beginner's mistakes. And if you don't have time to make up for that, you will have to live with, with dirty code always, always. And this is not Grails' problem, or Groovy's for that matter. It's any technology's new, pro new pr uh, problem. So specifically, you need to, in to in invest in learning about Grails. Be whenever you get a new technology, the more radical it is, uh, the, the more you have to invest. That's how it is. And what radical means depends on you and your organization and so on. And you need to grow your own experts. It's not adequate that we are so, so good at this. Some of us, at least, have, have to be very good at this technology, whether it's a database technology or Grails or something. Maybe this was our biggest mistake. OK, here's another one. So we hired a consultant because none of us were very good at Grails. Uh, well, that's what consultants are for. So, and we had some deadlines, <laughs> and we had some unstable requirements, and our development environment was not very good, and we struggled with building a team that was way too large, and so on. So, in the end, uh, our project manager, blame the project manager, uh, asked the consultant to say, you go implement the first version of this portal, and the rest of you guys leave him alone. So, he coded the way, and we got a portal out of it, which none of us understand. Then the, the consultant left because that's what consultants do. Because once their job is done, they, they get fired with five minutes notice. Poor souls. So another quote, letting a consultant do all the difficult stuff alone, instead of acting as a consultant, helping us do the difficult stuff, even if it would take a longer time. So do get an expert, uh, a consultant, fine, whatever. But have him teach and coach. Tie his hands on his back so he won't write any code himself. Let him teach us how to do it. Do not let him work alone. That might have been our biggest mistake. Using Groovy on the back end, uh, well, we decided at some point that, uh, hey, why, why write the back end in, in Java? Because Groovy is a much cooler language, so why not use that instead? My manuscript says the audience cheers when I say Groovy is a much cooler language. OK, thank you. Well, we need to practice that one. So. Um, the good news is that Groovy and Java interaction, no problems whatsoever, it just works. But <laughs> compilation time, maybe that's just our fault, the way we set up things, but it's slow to compile. Generates lots of steps and things. The turnaround time is still long on the back end, as I told you, and um, we don't have any st static type checking uh, in, in the Groovy code on the back end. Yes, I do know about type checked, uh, we just haven't gotten around to introducing it, and that's probably stupid. But that means that we have this enormous long turnaround time. 
And of course, we get some ungroovy code because those who understand Groovy and Grails are mainly focused on implementing the portal because uh, that's where you need that the most. So the back end is where we put the C's and Java programmers and tell them to code in, in Groovy. Well, I still think it's a good idea. It was mine, but maybe it's a bad idea. So. Some mistakes, we made others, but these are the most uh, Grails-like mistakes, so which one was the biggest? What do you think? Please? Education. education, lack of education, yes, it's certainly a big mistake, yes. Any other, ta other takers? Okay, here's mine letting the consultant work alone. I, I see this really as a root cause of many of the other things because we relied so much on him. Had he actually been there as a consultant, you know, consultant, consultation means giving advice. Um, then he, he could have educated us and he could have uh, proved our, our decisions and we could have used him to survey the great landscape. Uh, and he did do all of these things, uh, but, but not enough because we let him code because we were in a hurry. So really, if I could do these projects all over again, this is the thing, the number one thing I would change, if I could. Okay, some happy notes before I, I, uh, I, I finish this. Uh, all the things here that start with a G, wonderful. They work, and they work together, and it's great. And then I need some more things with a G, like Gradle, for instance. Our build environment is obscenely bad. Uh, the online resources, the online community where you can go for help and instruction and tips and tricks, wonderful. I mean, just browsing around Stack Overflow looking for, for what people have written about their groovy problems is a good way to learn about what problems people have out in the world. Uh, the books are great, written by several of the people present at this conference. Uh, lots of enthusiasm really on, on the project uh, and the project as, as such really, uh, really benefited from this choice, so okay, not a problem. So, was it wise? Yes. All in all, selecting Grails and Groovy and so on uh, has been a good journey. Um, I would do it again any day, I only do it better, so I hope to get transferred to a new project where we all don't have all this old luggage, so we can start afresh and do properly the next time. Meanwhile, as we speak here, uh, there are people working on, 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 on this system, uh, not just this system, but we've got two other projects uh, for completely different uh, customers doing completely different things, and they are also Grails projects. So at the moment, we've got something like between 20 and 30 programmers at Systematic who are Grails and Groovy, or getting more and more Grails and Groovy-like. So we're getting some sort of mass here. That's interesting. Yeah. So uh, really, uh, for you, uh, please don't repeat our mistakes. Uh, go do your own, there are plenty uh, you can go do, and then come back here next year and tell us about your mistakes, because then we'll all learn. Okay, got a few moments for questions and comments. So please, anything? Please. Okay. Yeah, uh, how do we do testing? Do testers write the test or do developers write the test? Developers write the tests uh, in collaboration with our product owners who specify really what the test should be and uh, specify the, the level of, of quality of the test. But all tests are implemented by developers but in close operation with the product owner and the user experience expert. Not on this project. Some of our projects at the company do, but we don't have dedicated testers. And dedicated testers, when we do have them, tend to be non-coders. So they can, they can do test design, but they can't implement tests. And, and that's really a shame. You ought to be able to do both. So that's a shortcoming there. Okay, other comments? Okay, thank you for your attention. That was great. Thank you, Jan. So um, we have ten.